Okay, so just a second, uh, let's just uh, go through this summary here on the board on some of the topics related to the course evaluation. I just like to give you some of the feedback based on the things I'm going to say. So in your evaluations, you said that you really appreciate the real world applications in this course. You like the video and the audio availability on the website. And I noticed from the uh, from the use of the website that that's uh, very popular, so that's, that's good to see. And uh, that's exactly what it's intended for, is if you miss a class or you'd like to review uh, a topic that wasn't clear the first time. Uh, you like the lecture, you like the lectures, you like the enthusiasm, and that's the show. Group work and teamwork are also quite high, and that, that is the intention of this course. You also appreciate the personal time for a letter, something I decided at the last minute to throw in, and so, um, just to fill in that first tutorial gap, so I'll keep that for future years um, and give a bit of positive reviews from that. We like the website and the resources, the economic section so far, we like it. <laughs> That's not surprising because the only section we've done so far. So, uh, uh, then uh, the tutorials were considered very helpful. Uh, the value of the tutorials, as we've seen in this slide, is considered uh, very valuable. Effective questions and tutorials, and they are they are structured like that potentially. And so on Fridays, usually I plan the, the class for the next week, and I decide on the questions based on the topics that are coming. So that's, that's the nature of those questions. They're a bit more open-ended. Uh, we we haven't necessarily seen the material. It's also a way for you to learn how to do uh, problem-based uh, learning and self-directed learning. So that's that's good. So a lot of this topic uh, positive reviews came from tutorials. The course organization seems to be going well. Um, my availability seems to be good. Self-directed independent learning is something that you value. The pace is not too fast or too slow. I was concerned about that a little bit um, with my courses. I tend to go a little bit on the fast side, but the um, pace seems to be okay. But I appreciate the fact that there's no textbook required and that there's notes available, so that's, that's interesting. But uh, that's just because this course, again, it is, it's very hard to find a textbook that covers the economic section as well as the, the next section that we're going to do coming up. It's the safety and the process operability and troubleshooting. To my knowledge, there's no textbooks that cover those in, in one single book, so we can't prescribe a book for those. And then people seem to like my accent and I I was speaking to my sister on the phone this weekend and she said, You sound American. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's not what I want to hear. Okay, so um, uh, the slides seem to be good, to uh, helpful. Uh, the pace of the class, like I said, seems to be good. Seems to be okay. Value of the lectures, uh, high, I'd like to see that. The TA assistance here seems to be uh, pretty middling uh, to average. And I have to actually take some of the blame for that because, like I said, I set up on tutorials on Friday. I usually work out the solutions on Saturday and Sunday and I mail it to them. And then the TAs really haven't had a chance to always look at, at, at that for Monday morning. So some of the fact that they're not always that up to speed with the material as I am in the tutorial time is just my fault just because of the coordination of when the tutorial slot works versus when I actually set up some of that. Um, that should become less of an issue now because the next tutorials coming up are, um, they exist already from previous years. So that's one aspect. And then there's more straightforward, the safety uh, side and then the economics, uh, sorry, the operability side. Those, those material already exist in this course. So you should see the TA being able to help you a bit more in the class for that. Some people comment that the TA is always on their phone and stuff. And the reason for that is simply they're on their phone for the same reasons you're on your iPods and phones, is they're also looking up stuff as well. So it's not that they're checking their email in the chat, but it's, um, they're also very meaningful answers in the same way you are. 
Um, hours spent outside the class seems to be very, very varied. Um, some people as much as 12 hours, some people 2 hours. Um, uh, uh, there's also a lot of people in the class that have been familiar with this material already from other uh, management and, and uh, economics. So that's not a busy class. It's not working for you. <laughs> okay, but then the more important side is the things where I can help uh, to improve on. So let's just talk, talk about some of these. The first uh, one was more industrial and real world examples. Christian, uh, there were six people related to that. So that's usually there's more people that have that in their mind. It's just not always uh, said. So definitely, yes, uh, you'll see all the safety material, all the operability material is very much applied to actual case studies coming up. The economics side, the first two, three weeks, that's a little bit more um, artificial problems just to get you used to the idea of NPVs and so on. But you'll see now coming up, we'll take these capital cost estimates that you've just been working on for heat exchanges, distillation costs. You have to integrate that with the estimate of the operating costs in a company. How many people do you need? How much working capital do you need? You'll start to see all of that coming together on some real problems in the next few uh, classes and tutorials. Uh, sample problems and solutions in the slide. I think that refers to the fact that uh, there's uh, these blanks like this in the slides. Uh, so what what I'll do is, uh, yeah, I, I don't mind posting the full solutions from the, from the like my version of the PowerPoint. I actually didn't realize until very recently that there were so many blanks in here. Uh, because I always work from the PowerPoint, that's got everything filled in, but then the printed notes came from another document that I uh, just sent to printed, didn't really look through to see how many holes there are. So I'll post the full version of the PowerPoints that you can fill in. <coughs> um, people were asking for fewer graded assignments. Um, well, yes, no, the tutorials are a way for us to uh, plan ahead for the next class and expose yourself to the next class. Uh, whether that, they should all be graded or not is, is I, I don't know. I think it is important that we have these frequently graded tutorials and assignments. The reason is, um, part of my other work that I do here at the university is I do a lot of research in education. That sh and the, there's a lot of positive proof that shows um, very quick, rapid exposure that are graded assignments and to tests are far more beneficial than having big gaps. So it's called the spacing effect in learning, um, and it's also called the testing effect in learning, and it's also called the feedback effect in learning. So all three of those combined, frequent tests with the feedback right away um, are far more effective than longer spaced assignments with infrequent feedback. Um, so I know that in some of the other instructors that I do this research with, they have tests in every single class. Um, so that's the extreme version of it. I prefer to just go once a week. Uh, but I don't think I will do away with fewer great designs. Um, the, what you will notice with this course is that after after the end of this month, October, it, it slows down quite dramatically as you get to this self-directed learning section. So there's only a few more assignments left on that anyway. Um, this is one short summary that is also my fault, not having assigned feedback right away. I will um, post the, the Excel files that I've been working on for the assignments to the course website. I apologize for not getting it back as soon as um, it's, it's just been a timing issue for my side. A uh, few people ask to slow down, I guess this is the pacing um, in the class. So yeah, it's, most people seem to think the pace is okay, and maybe a little bit on the class side, so sure, I'll, I'll slow down a little bit for the coming sections, uh, but not too much. The assignments shorter, <laughs> again, yeah, I do have longer assignments in my, in my courses. So sure, they will be, I'll, 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 I'll shorten them up a bit. Uh, down to like four questions or so, just to give you a chance to cover them all in the tutorial. That was the main, the main comment. Is, can we uh, slow them, uh, have fewer questions and then cover them all in the tutorial? So sure, not a problem. Um, more comments on assignment reductions. I'll follow up with the TAs on that to make sure that uh, they, they take care of that. And the website discussion board came up in this course and in other course, so I'll put that on Avenue and open up the discussion board there. I, I haven't used Avenue's discussion board, so I don't know what that's about, but um, I guess you have in other courses. So um, that should be available to you. The STL project, uh, there was some there's some worries and concerns about that. What's, it's, there's more uncertainty right, uh, on what's coming on that. So what I, what I thought to do is I will try to get an SDL project from a previous year to post to the course website to give you an idea of what 
the full project looks like. Um, also, it is, it is coming where I describe exactly what the scope of the project is. I, I know it's been very verbal in the class but not, and nothing on paper for you to go back to. But uh, more details on the SDL project will come up this, this week uh, where you start to scope out your area that you, your group has selected. Uh, don't require cover letters. Uh, know that that is a requirement for this course is one of the skills to, to learn. Though you may use it infrequently when you start uh, working, uh, you always need to preface your work to your manager in an email, whether that's as short as a single sentence or a paragraph, uh, that could be a cover letter of sorts, or whether it's more formal and actually goes outside your company to clients or to government agencies. This is something you must learn, and you don't teach this in any other courses, so it is, it is a valuable skill, and I'm not going to take that one away. As annoying as it is, I know, uh, and it seems a little bit weird, to do this for the assignment. It is a good skill to, to master at least during school. So uh, make sure that in your group, when you submit, you at least get one or two opportunities to write the final letter for your group. Um, then just some minor points here on the classes structure. Uh, have more tutorials, fewer classes, spend more time on important topics, do more teaching and no or less SDL, uh, more review problems, get more input from the students during the class, and take time to explain financial concepts. Um, so a lot of that's related to pacing and, and allocation of time. I'm reluctant to have less lectures and more tutorials. The reason is mainly this class isn't suitable for the tutorial. Uh, so if we need to block off the, a whole hour here in the class and make it a tutorial rather than um, the teaching time is not going to be an effective use of the space. And also, I don't have access to the TAs during this time. Uh, they actually have other courses that they take during this time. So it's, it's not going to be a, a possibility to, to do that. Um, I will go add more of these questions where you get to work on like a five minute problem and uh, we'll take it up on the board. I will do that for sure. But um, I, I don't want to cancel the classes and, and turn them into tutorials. It's not a good thing over here. Um, regarding assignments and tutorials here, more detailed solutions, absolutely, they'll be coming. Um, more teaching during the tutorial period. Again, <laughs> this is the opposite side. I know I've used some of the tutorial a bit for teaching and introducing concepts or uh, reaffirming concepts. Uh, so I will do a little bit of that, but the tutorials are a chance for you to work with your group and see the you, you and your group uh, battle with the problem and figure it out together, not for you to teach, teach those problems to you. Tutorials every other week. Um, that just will happen inadvertently coming from now on because the day of the midterm I'll cancel tutorials, there's no sense in, like no one will show up for those tutorials so I'll cancel them that day. And then also Thanksgiving this week, cancel the tutorial effectively. And then coming up in the next two, three weeks the, as the SDL project starts, uh, tutorials will be cancelled. So they will just by the way that the timetabling works, uh, tend to be almost every other week. Less tedious problems. Um, I didn't think they were too tedious, but okay. And then um, more Cambridge examples, more TA interaction. So I'll take that up with the TAs. More Cambridge examples, well, the examples, I'm sure that economics based, they may not seem engineering based, but that is one of the aspects of this section of the course we're on right now is that it, you may not see distillation columns and equations for reactors and so on, um, but the examples you'll be working on are Cambridge based and how relevant to Cambridge. Even examples that are related to patents and royalties, though they don't seem Cambridge related, you definitely will be requiring to understand what the patent is and the financial implications of that. Uh, your company um, may, you may pay patent something in the company yourself and then your company licenses that out as a royalty payment to your competitor. Uh, so you need to understand what those, those terms are and uh, even though they're not directly Cambridge related, they, you will see them Future. Website post examples, sure, I'll do that. Uh, practice questions for the midterm. I will post uh, previous, uh, the previous two or three midterms to the website. Uh, I don't have solutions for the awards, so I may not have those, but I'll definitely post the questions for you to see what the level of um, the questioning will be for the midterm. And keep the old amount. Yeah, okay, I think I can do that. So those are, those are my. Um, my comments based on, on your feedback, which I really appreciate. Was there anything else that, uh, any questions or doubts you want to raise in your thoughts?
capital issues. If you have uh, something more to say uh, that you may not have had a chance to write, or uh, based on this feedback, you have something else that you now have in mind, please use the feedback form on the course website, and then I can make sure that we keep this uh, course at the level that you want. Okay, so let's go back to the notes where we were last week. <coughs> that had some differences in pressure and temperature, sorry, the differences in pressure and materials of construction relative to the base case class. And we saw most of the class being uh, the costing for that particular to so pay attention to the fact that when we upgrade the materials of construction and the pressure, that the piping costs are not appropriate to inflate directly through the bare market factor. We have to account for piping separately through the piping factory. Uh, so I, I, won't, I won't recap that example, but what I will emphasize is um, one, one point that I didn't get to in the class of the Friday was we use that factor of 0.46. So what we said is that the bare module factor for an heat exchanger comes up to be 3.37, but it's made up of many components. The, the unit itself, the heat exchanger, if you want it for one dollar, uh, 46 cents of that dollar would uh, be spent additionally on the piping. So if you spend a dollar on the heat exchanger, you need 46 cents extra to spend on piping, five cents on concrete steel, and so on. Um, and all of that means we added up to a factor of 3.37 that we then just multiply the heat exchanger cost by in the future. So that 3.37 will account for everything to get the unit up and running and operate in that fictitious bare module space of a 3 by 3 by 3 meter um, radius or distance. So that 0.46 factor that we used in the equation comes from this breakdown over here. But that's 4.46 is a factor that's relevant for shallow shape heat exchange. It's not relevant for every single piece of equipment. Um, and what you need to look up then, or look based on these notes, is for some selected equipment, that piping factor varies. So for furnaces, it would be as low as 0.18. Um, just there's not too much external piping on a furnace that goes around relative to a heat exchange that's 0.46. For air cooled heat exchangers, again, much less piping required there. You don't need a utility street um, always on that. So then the vertical vessels, horizontal vessels, they have their factors that are similar to heat exchangers, and then compressors and pumps have, have lower factors. So that 0.46 key point here is not always constant for every single unit. Look up the appropriate value for the unit that you're um, look size. Which part of the question does uh, account for the rest of the um, charges? Because we only use 0.46, right? Right, okay, so good good point. Let's uh, let's come back to this table then, which is, I think, blank, one of the blank ones in the notes. Oh, it's, it's, it's slide 154, which is non-existent in the notes. Um, so I'm going to leave it up there for the next few minutes, and you can write it down. But essentially, this is the example we did in the class uh, last Friday. And I'll answer your question now related to it. One thing just about this slide as, you, as you're copying it down, um, or I will post it also to the website if you, if you want. But the, remember in class when I did my order, I inflated for in, uh, for the fact of inflation right at the end. Okay. So I had up there on the black board part of the, of the board the uh, procedure I followed, and the first step is just to look up the correlation, then the second step is to check the range, then get the base cost, then adjust for materials and pressure, then adjust for, um, finally, once you add all those up, then you adjust for inflation, for the fact that the table is in 1970 and we're working in 2000 or something. So here, though, what Dr. Marlin has done in his slides is he's adjusted for inflation right up at the front. So he's taken the cost in 2000 by multiplying by 1089 divided by 301 times 6210. And then in the, the rest of these, this was the derivation I did on the, on, the, on the board over here, was we looked at was the incremental cost for installing this unit, the incremental cost for temperature and materials, um, and then we added the incremental cost for the piping due to the materials. 
and then we summed all these four together. But in, what I did is I was working in 1970 dollars and did these calculations and then summed them up and then inflated that, that sum of them up to present day value. What Dr. Marlon has done in his slides is he's gone straight to 2000 in his first line and then done all the, the installation changes and the pressure changes in $2,000. But you'll come out to exactly the same answer over here. So that's why I'm, I'm leaving this up here for a minute, just so that you can take it down. Um, and you'll have the two options. Uh, you can either choose to inflate for present day dollars right at the beginning of your problem and then work for, through the rest of it, or you can choose to do it at the end. Mm -hmm. You'll always get the same, the same answer. So while, while we're taking it down, I'll just, uh, just recap that problem then. The first step we did is we looked up the correlation for heat exchanger, and it's the carbon steel. It gave us a base price of 8,000, but it was for a 100 meter squared heat exchanger. Our exchanger was 70 meters squared. So we have to ratio 70 to 100 raised to the power of N. Then, as I just described it, you can inflate to $2,000 by using the Marshall and Swift index. So 1089 is the value of 2000 divided by 301, the value of 1970. So a $6,000 heat exchange in 1970 costs 22500 This is the price that you would get on the quotation from the supplier of the heat exchange. That's the FOV price. But when we take that, what we would normally do is we would normally just take that price of that equipment and then multiply it by the bare module factor to get the price of that unit fully installed at our site. But the reason why we don't just go ahead and multiply by the bare module factor and end the problem over there is because in this case, uh, we have some additional changes to make to account for the fact that we're operating at higher pressure and with different materials of construction. And so we need to alter that, that cost here. But what we said is that the fact that we're updating these units to work at higher temperature and high and different materials does not affect the installation of it. To pay for installation is the same no matter what the materials of construction are, no matter what the unit pressure rating is. So what we do is we find what is the portion of the bare module factor that's related purely to the installation. And it's uh, quite simple. You take your bare module factor multiplied by the units subtract out the cost of the unit. So that's the incremental price that you pay to have the unit fully installed, foundation, painting, insulation, all, all of those uh, things go in there, including piping. This 48,000 that you pay in addition includes all the piping in that three meter region, but it includes piping as if it's made from carbon steel, the base material of construction. We're not making uh, this unit of carbon steel. We're choosing to make it out of stainless steel. So we're going to have to inflate, inflate those prices and inflate also for the fact that we're operating in higher temperatures. And then, so that's what this third line is about. This third line tells us if I took the base price of the, of the unit, multiplied it by the pressure factor and multiplied it by the material factor, that, and then subtract out the base price of the unit again, that is going to get me the incremental price I'm paying to the vendor of the unit. This $8,000 is what I have to pay in addition to the $22,000. So the vendor is going to give me a bill for $22,000 plus $80,000, about $100,000, and that's to supply a heat exchanger that's made of the, the correct materials that I require, as well as the, the correct pressure rate. Then we have to take into account in our, inside our bare module, this $80,000, uh, what, what multiplier can we use to multiply this by to get the price of the additional piping inside that bare module? That's piping that's made to withstand the pressure that we're requiring and the piping that's made out of carbon steel. So that additional cost is to take the, the, the price that we've paid over here for the piping and then multiply it by the piping factor that we, that we got from those tables, 0.46, multiplied by an additional factor, psi. Uh, psi is a number that you can pick either between 0.7 or 1. 
And it simply says it's the percentage of the piping inside that bare module region that I'm going to replace. So in this case, we're going to the low end and saying we'll need to replace about 70% from carbon steel up to 316. Um, no, we're not going to change everything inside the bare module. And that makes sense because for heat exchangers, some of that piping as carbon steel would work quite adequately, probably for drainage or for the cold end of the, of the exchanger that doesn't require um, the 316 or parts of the, the unit that are not in contact with the product. So it doesn't need that additional cost. So you can vary this factor depending on your application. So what we then sum up is our price to pay to the vendor, which is this first and third line. The first and third line is what you would pay to the supplier. The second and the fourth line is what you would pay to the person who's installing this for you. So you pay the installation price of 48000 plus an additional 25800 for the um, improved piping. And then sum those up and report, report the total with the 40% error. So that's, that's just a recap of last, last class. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll post a homework problem for you. Uh, two homework problems for you, actually, for you to try out. One that's like this, we have to upgrade the pressure and the materials and temperature. And then another one that's a little bit um, different. So I'll just put, I'll actually just put it up here right now. So here's your homework problem. I'll post it on the course website also. But uh, this, by, by Thursday's class in the morning, I'd like you to, to do the following. Estimate the capital cost of a distillation column made up of 316 stainless steel. So the hardest part actually of this problem is really just finding the correlation. So determine the capital cost of the 316 stainless steel distillation column that's 21 meters high, uh, 2.3 meters in diameter with 26 trays. Um, I will add there that those trays are in standard spacing which is two feet, and it operates at 3.2 MPA. And then I'll post an additional problem to the website that will require you to uh, use the, the factors for piping and material and pressure and temperature. So both of those problems that I'll take up in Thursday's class, and Thursday's class will also be a summary of the entire economic section, and uh, we'll move on to safety on Friday. <laughs> but what I'd like you to, to work on next is uh, this particular problem. Uh, so estimate, just for the next five minutes or so, um, this one should be relatively straightforward as well, but there's some interesting uh, concepts that come in front, so I just wanted to cover this example. Estimate the bare module cost in 2000 for the following unit. Uh, this is a packaged vapor decompression refrigeration unit, uh, so a, a, a chilling unit with this heat exchange capacity, 7,040 kilowatts. The evaporator in this unit is operating at uh, 275, so just above zero degrees. Um, and it's fully, it's a full, a full unit, including the compressor, condenser, motor, insulation, uh, insulation, delivery, everything fully installed, making carbon steel. Okay, so there's a, a pictorial diagram. Here's one here on campus in the boiler house. So we're estimating the capital cost for one of those guys. Okay, so let's, uh, Let's look at that. You, um, if you don't, I guess you don't have Don Woods' book available to you. But what, for those of you that have an internet connection um, on your laptop or your phone, I'll give you a minute or two to try and figure out which section of for the book you would go to to, to, to get this. And then I'll put the page up and then the rest of you can work on it. Uh, for those of you that don't have any other connection. The hardest part usually is figuring out where to look in the book. <laughs> Uh, just a, uh, there was a question on the midterm, would you require the whole book? Uh, no, I will print out the pages from the book that you that you might would possibly need. <laughs>
the important way, uh, the important thing to realize about bond words is both what you what you need definitely with you is uh, some parts of chapter one, and then you definitely need the table of contents to, to try and locate some of this information. So uh, the table of contents that we just actually we can take a look at that extra. Um, so the way to use it, uh, if you're looking for refrigeration in this section, the way I would go about it is uh, chapter one is a general chapter that shows how to use the book. Chapter two uh, gives you the process of reactors, so atmospheric vessels, uh, reactors that have heat exchangers built into them, gas liquid storage and solid storage vessels. Chapter three is all about mixing. So liquid mixes, solid mixes. Um, one thing I've noticed about the book is that they, all these example calculations, they don't exist. Uh, so the book just goes up to the prior section. I'm, I, this is not my PDF, I, I don't have access to the original, so I don't even know if there were ever example calculations, which is unfortunate. Uh, Constant equipment uh, due to change in size, the size reduction size. Energy exchange. So here's the heat exchange section that we've been using in this chapter. Uh, separation equipment, so evaporators, distillation. Uh, so that already tells you where to look for that uh, sample from the cooking tomorrow's class. You will find the section Here's some um, separation equipment, so gas solid, liquid solid, liquid solid, but the centrifugal separations, um, precious based solid liquid separators, there's membrane separators in here, there's drying units, solid solid separators, so the costing for all of those units uh, would be chapter 7. Chapter 8 is uh, uh, pipe uh, pumps, uh, liquid moving, uh, reducting, and so on. And chapter 9 is on the utilities. So this is where we would find the section on the refrigeration. Uh, so there's industrial gases, disposal of gases and solids, um, and, and other utilities that we would typically find in the company. Um, and the last few chapters are over there. They're on material costs up for a day-to-day -day basis. So let's take a look then at chapter 9, which is where we would expect to look for those refrigeration data. Um, Okay, so the first page of the chapter is, uh, gives you a, a breakdown of, of the, what's coming on in the next section. So these are the main parts you would look for. And here we see refrigeration. So it should be a little bit into the chapter, we find a section on refrigeration. Uh, going down. So here's generation first, the cost for those units. Steam generation, so more steam. Electrical power, um, even a nuclear power plant. Okay. Um, and then here's refrigeration. Okay, so this is this would be the correlation we would need to use. So that's uh, step one of our approach is to determine the correlation. So this um, seems to be the based on the type of appropriate one. Let's double check. Uh, that's the second step is to check the range of the correlation. So this is for mechanical vapor recompression uh, with evaporators and fully packaged unit delivered, including the compressor, condenser, instrumentation. Um, it seems to be everything that we're looking for in, in our capital cost estimate, except uh, it doesn't include the cooling tower. Uh, there's multipliers that could operate the evaporator and cement. Temperatures away from the base case. So the base case temperature is 4.4 degrees C. You can see that over here the multiplier at the base case is 1 made from carbon steel. <coughs> the base unit then is for, based on uh, the size and capacity is based purely on the amount of kilowatt to exchange here. So refrigeration capacity the base case is a thousand kilowatts. <coughs> Whereas 
our requirement was for And that ratio goes from zero to that ratio is only valid between point zero two to five. So our ratio is about seven, which is greater than five. Correlations on value. What do we do? One potential suggestion to use a different n value. Um, I would probably recommend against that, uh, just given the fact that N only has 0.77, so I would expect that <coughs> 6 would then definitely be underestimating it, if anything. Um, what you're, what you're, you're, when you get to a correlation that's not valid as well, we can look at how by how much is it not valid. Right? So if we were needed a unit that was 5.5 and the range was valid to 5, you could probably go ahead and use the correlation anyway. Um, and in fact, here with the case of 7, we will still go ahead and use the correlation anyway, but proceed with caution. Uh, what I would also suggest you do then is, in these cases, is you would then look for an outside quote on it, um, depending on the time and availability that you have. But here, if, we're, if this is the only information you've got to go on, um, yes, we, we just have to hope that that correlation is still valid up to seven, which is somewhat of an extrapolation, but it's the best we can do. If I was working in a company, I would, in addition to proceeding with this work here that we do on the board, I would also start to look for some quotes from outside. Absolutely, and then, then another option then would be to look for another correlation. Um, this material uh, was written in 1980s, so this book, um, it may have been updated with, um, with more, but the problem is in this whole area of capital cost estimation is we find that mostly the data is available only to 1970. There's been very little work done on refreshing this data for more than days. So uh, we will proceed with that, um, that and but just note that, that that's the portion we need to take. So if we're uh, then step number three is to get the base cost. which in this case is 100,000, so 100 times 10 to the power 3, 100,000 dollars in 1970 for the base unit. Then we adjust for the capacity. Times this factor of 704 divided by 1,000 raised to the power of 0.77, which would get you a cost in 1970 of about 450,000. The question also asked for um, the evaporator was working at 275 Kelvin. So is there any need here to adjust for temperature and sorry, temperature of 275? If we just go back though to the base case, it was designed for an evaporator of 4.4 degrees C. Uh, so 275 Kelvin is 2 degrees roughly two degrees. So what we notice here though is there is quite a, a high degree of sensitivity to temperature in this unit. Um, by changing from 4.4 degrees the base case to minus 1.1, the, the factor starts to go up already. And uh, the factor goes up quite dramatically further, further to go away, um, fairly strongly. And the unit, in fact, gets cheaper if you need to operate at warmer temperatures, which also makes sense. So 
the temperature factor, if you, if you use interpolation in this case, uh, is, is 1.2. So I'm going to put your F subscript T is 1.02. Uh, so what we would do then is, well, you've got two cases here. You could say, well, this is so close to 1 that I'm just going to ignore it, um, potentially. And, and we'll land up in the error of your estimate. But what I'll do is I'll work through the fact that we did use this as our, as our uh, temperature. And so what we would get then is that the incremental cost of temperature is in the same way we, we saw before, to take your base price multiplied by the temperature factor minus one. So in this case, you take your base price over here, which is over there, and then multiply it by 1.02 minus 1. In other words, you're just adding 2% of that. Well, that's equal to an additional $9,000. So the, the fact that we're operating just slightly away from base case is going to cost us an additional $9,000 to handle that, that temperature. Then, do we go ahead and adjust for piping like we did last time? What would be your sense in this case of doing that? So last time we showed the incremental cost inside the bare module for the piping in this unit. One reason why you may not want to do that in this case is simply if we look at our bare module factor, it's 1.4. It says that if you take the price of this unit, $100,000, or I've inflated it for, um, for, for capacity over here, it's only going to cost me 40% addition to that to have the unit installed and in, in account for the bare module piping around the unit. Okay, so, um, if I ignore this small temperature factor here, multiplied by a correspondingly small bare module factor, I'm not going to be much off by accounting for piping in this particular case. So I, 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 I probably wouldn't do that in this instance. The other reason is, one thing that you should be asking yourself is, why is the bare module factor 1.4 so small in this particular instance? Normally we've been seeing values of about 3, 3.5, any guess why the main module factor is, is fairly small in this, in this particular unit? Because so much is included in the... Uh, right, the included, inclusions here, it includes the compressor, the condensers, uh, a lot of the installation components. The other reason is that if we take a look physically at the unit itself, uh, there's, there's a pictorial diagram on it, and there's the unit delivered and installed. So the very module around this unit would be this additional piping and the foundation for that unit. There isn't too much extra on here. This unit comes pre-delivered like this. All the piping that's already there is internal to the unit. Um, it just requires the hookup for uh, up here at the top, the condenser water coming out and the chilled water in it. That's all that that 40% extra is for, is for, the, for that piping hookup. Um, there seems to be minimal instrumentation on this unit uh, and, and probably just the most UK pays for the foundation and, the, and the securing that and leveling. So that additional cost then, um, you're not going to be much off by, by ignoring the bare model, model factor and then multiplying by the piping. So in this case, uh, you could just simply say a, an estimate of the price then is, is as follows. Take the bare module value of 100,000, adjust the capacity, recognizing that we're extrapolating. So if we make that note over here, correlations are valid, we are extrapolating. So that needs to be clear in your in the solution that you present to your manager, is that this is an extrapolated estimate. Then adjust for $2,000. Oh, okay, yeah. we, I, I didn't do that over here. I tend to do that at the end, but Dr. Marlin and his solution has adjusted for $2,000 right at the front. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll continue to work through my example here and inflate the dollar that we're going to be the same dollar. Then he's inflated uh, by this 2% addition for temperature. And, um, in my case, I get $9,000. Uh, in 1970, he gets 33000 in 2000. There's the bare module factor of 1.4. This very small value makes sense in this case because of the integrated nature of the unit. And then you sum those two components up. The bare module price plus this additional um, factor there due to the temperature handle. So if I finish up my example, I take that 9,000 um, and I'll add it to my bare module factor. So let's move this over here. So my bare module cost in 1970 would be the 450,000 that I got earlier times 1.4. That gets me 630,000. And then I'm going to add here the $9,000 for temperature. Which gets me 639. And then I choose to inflate at the end. So the bare module price in 2000 would be equal to 639 times 1089 divided by 301, which gets you uh, 2310. So $2.3 million uh, dollars to install this unit. Plus or minus 30%. So then that 30% factor comes from the table over here. This error column is 30% in this case for this, for this unit. So anywhere between uh, 1.4 million to 3.2 million. Would be, the, would be the range that you would call to your manager. <coughs> there is some advice in, in some of the textbooks that says if you don't know what the bare module factor is, use a value of 3.6 as a default. Uh, in that case, you would get such an inflated estimate of about $6 million. So really, it's not just uh, don't use that 3.6 factor as a default without really thinking about the situation. Here, it's an integrated unit, a smaller value is far more appropriate than a value. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll post that um, on the course.